Good morning. This is the August uh, 2023 AMSA Talks, and I'm sitting here with Kristen Bronson of the Colorado Lawyers Committee. And we're just going to talk for about uh, an hour about the uh, how a city attorney can assist team leaders and policymakers in putting together the plan to create an alternative responder team. Uh, Kristen, you were deeply involved in the development of Denver Star and have been following this issue for quite a while. Uh, welcome to EMSA. Thanks for having me. I sure appreciate it. Well, why don't you tell us about yourself first <laughs> and sort of your interest in this subject and then walk us through the beginning of Denver Star. We'll be hearing from Evan Tompkins in a couple of months about the upcoming report. Sounds really good, what's coming from Denver, um, but we wanna hear from you first. Sure, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I think a tremendously successful program and there's a wonderful story to tell there. Um, my story um, is that uh, I was a trial attorney for 20 years, um, very familiar with risk mitigation, civil liability, have advised clients for decades in that regard. Um, but I left in 2016 to become Denver's city attorney and run the Department of Law here. Uh, I did that for six years. And in that role, um, I advised all the city agencies and mayor's office selected um, officials, uh, but also the safety agencies um, and was a very close uh a friend and confidant of our police chief, fire chief, uh, sheriff, um, and uh, you know regularly worked with them on speed dial uh, for any number of issues affecting um, safety and crime in Denver. Part of that, of course, was the formation and the early precursors to Denver's STAR program. Um, in, in a, another capacity though, I was also a founding board member of a foundation called Caring for Denver. Caring for Denver Foundation's origins were through a voter approved ordinance where we have a dedicated sales tax stream that generates anywhere from 39 to $45 million a year that must be used for mental and behavioral health services in Denver. And that foundation, um, of which I was a founding board member, um, has been one of the primary financial supporters, in addition to the city of Denver, of course, uh, for our STAR program, and really helped, um, I think, bring that program to fruition. Um, I am now currently the executive director of the Colorado Lawyers Committee, uh, which is a consortium of over 80 law firms that coordinate uh, pro bono legal work to advance and create opportunities for youth and the underserved in Colorado. Um, so that's that's me and that's kind of my origin story with respect to uh, STAR and how all of this happened. Oh, I can't hear you, Jason. <laughs> there we go. So at, at, at what point in the development of STAR were you brought in to start assisting and and what had been done before you got there? Yeah, it's a really uh, uh, good question uh, because the story doesn't start with STAR, right? Hmm. Um, in Denver, um, traditionally, when you called 911, there were two main ways in which your call was handled. Um, it was either um, uh, forwarded and sent to the police or it was forwarded and sent to more of a um, hospital health system response. Um, STAR ultimately provided that third option for us. Um, but prior to STAR, there was certainly momentum and community support building for alternative first response. And that began with programs like pretrial diversion. Uh, we had a number of pretrial diversion programs, including the LEAD program um, and others that were directed oftentimes at discrete populations. So it could be sex workers, it could be people addicted to uh, drugs or alcohol, um, 
but where an alternative response was needed to just sending this person off to jail. What they really needed were services. And so, but police would still be called out with those pretrial diversion programs. They worked hand in hand with officers on the street. Um, and, and in those situations when someone was encountered um, who you know, really needed in the officer's evaluation on the street, uh, services rather than jail, they could be sent to a program partner. Um, a second iteration uh, was when uh, the Denver Police Department uh, developed a co-responder program. And our co-responder program, and both of these were, all of these were precursors to STAR. In our co-responder program, uh, that was a program really developed um, ultimately in-house where we hired mental and behavioral health specialists who would ride along with officers. And when they responded to a crisis situation involving someone in a mental health crisis, um, they would be there with the officer, with an armed officer on scene to respond. And those, um, both, all of those programs were showing really good results. And I think we had good track records with both. And my office and my, we, I was very involved um, in the creation of those programs, contracts and risk liability related to those programs. Um, many of them, including diversion, you know, required sign off by municipal prosecutors who I supervised. Uh, but then I would have um, contract attorneys on my team that would help put the programs into place and work with partners. So all of those were, I think, building momentum, showing a great track record, creating the case for ultimately STAR. You know, but STAR really was born in many respects through community, um, community demands. Uh, the city itself had had a number of incidents, really tragic incidents, uh, yeah. involving excessive force, both in the jails or officers on the street. Mm -hmm. That had led to really tragic results, injuries, death, and uh, a lot of big verdicts, uh, big case settlements. And I think people were just um, ready for a change, both, I would say, the community, but also um, city leadership. Um, and just to get straight, the, the, did Denver have a CIT program already up and running? Yes. Yes. Okay. Denver had had a CIT program, and our um, police chief, had made the commitment that his officers would be, you know, CIT trained. All of them? Yes, all okay. of them. Okay. Yes, all of them. We have, I mean, our police chief at the time, and this was critical, frankly, to the success of, of STAR and, and getting our program up and running. Um, our police chief is considered a very innovative chief, probably one of the more progressive ones in the, in the country. And, um, you know, he embraced very early on the concept of trauma-informed harm reduction alternatives, uh, STAR being one of them. And you're speaking of Paul Pazin? Pazin. Pazin. Yes. yes, Chief Pazin. And he's just recently retired. Would you tell us a little bit about him? Chief Pazin was a, a longtime Denver officer who rose through the ranks. Um, he came from a, a long legacy of um, civic leadership community volunteerism. Um, his mother was very involved in the housing authority for many years, is really well known. <clears throat> Chief Pazin grew up in a family wrapped in public service mm -hmm. and was um, you know, a, a very involved uh, also in the Latino community. Uh, rose through the ranks. He was um, appointed uh, chief, uh, police chief by Mayor Hancock during his administration. Um, and uh, was um, a primary driver of ensuring the success of the STAR program. Well, uh, that's such an interesting point that the, the, when the sheriff, or excuse me, the chief gets on board early <clears throat> and, and actively, it makes such a difference in the progress, the political progress of these teams. I think that's right. And, it, and I want to say it wasn't just our police chief. I mean, our um, our uh, fire chief was also, I think, very engaged at the time um, and uh, uh, 
the emergency response uh, paramedic crew at our public safety net hospital, Denver Health, were very supportive. Um, so we were lucky uh, to have a leadership team that listened to the community, that understood the need for an alternative, a meaningful um, alternative response program that was more comprehensive than uh, some of these diversion or co-responder programs we'd had to date. I want to go back for a moment and talk about the advocates, the impact of advocates. And uh, you're sitting in the city attorney's office, the establishment of the city, and you're hearing these people who are really angry, especially people from, and my understanding is Denver, This uh, much, of, much of this came from the Hispanic community, La Raza, yes. et cetera. Um, how does that feel as a person? You know, hearing that anger, hearing that hostility towards the establishment that you represent, and how do you, how do you as a person shift that into policy? Well, I certainly didn't take it personally. Um, I mean, this was, a, I think, um, a, not an unusual sentiment that Denver was experiencing that that was happening really nationwide. Um, there has been um, a real national movement. Um, around finding um, uh, ways to better police communities and particularly vulnerable populations who have been over-policed historically. Um, and it's, it's, again, not to uh, point the finger at anyone, um, but we've asked police to do too much in this country. Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of people feel that way, including police officers. Yeah. Um, they, as I've said before, they can't be every everything for everyone. And we've asked them to do too much. And it really was, I think Denver maybe was tip of the spear in some ways, but what was a national reckoning around um, how can we better deploy police to do the core job that they are best at? And how can we ensure that people who need an alternative response, people who um, are in crisis, people who perhaps don't present an immediate um, violent risk um, are getting the kind of response that they need to assist them while um, uh, and protecting while continuing to protect the community. And I think as a community, we in Denver said we can do better and the city knew that. I mean, let, let me also mention, there was also anger and frustration within city government about the kinds of payouts that the city yeah. was making as a result of these lawsuits and claims. Uh, we have a very robust civil rights bar here in Colorado and they do a very good job. They are very effective um, as they should be. Um, and so I think while yes, the community was clamoring and yelling and then in some instances you know, demanding change, I think that, that on a parallel track you had very good-hearted uh, uh, city leaders feeling defeated um, with the outcomes that we were seeing in many of these um, interactions with police. And I think we all knew we could do better. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna also highlight our sheriff, uh, Sheriff Elias Diggins, who was very supportive, who also was, was raising the red flag to say, I have too many people in my jail that really don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. And and it is leading to bad interactions within the jail because they need services, they need help, they need a, um, a medical setting or a trauma-informed setting, not a jail, which seems to be exacerbating or certainly is not helping um, their condition and it's leading to bad outcomes. So we had a, we had a lot of, um, I think, uh, common or shared values with what we were hearing in the community that helped helped us move forward. So that's interesting that you you were hearing that from the city attorney's office from all kinds of sources, not just within the city, but outside. Were there other entities? So the civil rights bar and the sheriffs, these are all sort of legalistic, but other um, entities around the city or were there other external pressures to get change moving? I mean, certainly there were a lot of community-based organizations, activists, um, there were uh, educators, parents, 
um, you know, this is in many respects tied to that school to prison pipeline issue and the over policing of, we talk about vulnerable people, but young people as well. Um, and so I think, uh, yes, that there was a lot of talk within the behavioral and mental health community. There was a lot of talk in the, um, you know, among youth leaders, activists, civil rights groups, um, community-based uh, organizations across the city, uh, really all coming together to find a better solution. Jason, I can't hear you again. I'm sorry. That's very interesting that you were able to listen and hear that external sound. And what was the, was there a, a part that the media played here in moving this forward? Uh, I mean, certainly the media covered every little payout that the city had in an excessive force case. And we'd had some really ugly ones. Um, and some involved officers on the job, some involved officers, officers working secondary uh, work off the job um, uh, overtime or uh, uh, secondary um, employment. But yes, those were covered uh, very heavily by the media. And uh, I would say also there was a legislative, there was a delegation that went out and visited the CAHOOTS program. Mm. Um, and that was instrumental. Uh, the lessons learned the um, the ideas and motivations and inspiration brought back from that trip was significant. There was some media coverage around cahoots, around some of these alternative response concepts that was happening, um, and our Denver press was certainly engaged in that conversation. Were you in this uh, research? Were you able to speak to other city attorneys in in other cities about what they were doing? Um, I did not, and I think I regret that at the time. Uh, there weren't a lot of cities um, that were that far ahead of us. Certainly the Coots program was one of those. I did send a city attorney on that trip, um, uh, but um, one of the things that I would highly recommend to folks uh, that are beginning these programs and starting those conversations is not only to involve the city, your city attorney or county attorney early in those conversations, but also for the city or county attorney to be encouraged to speak with their peers in other cities. I think those lessons learn that, you know, the, um, the helping develop um, the checklist for what to consider when forming these programs would have been especially helpful. I think to us early on, uh, but we felt a little bit like we were inventing things out of whole cloth at the time. And I don't know that it, you know, really needed to be that way. So now with the experience under your belt, what, what, what do you, as a city attorney, when you go and look at a team, what are you looking for? Not just in the team itself, but in the, all the policy background. Are you, when you say the team, do you mean the, the first response team that, that would be the city partner? Right. The equal of De Denver star. Got it. Well, um, you know, first of all, I would say, you know, a city's got to decide whether they want to build it in-house or, or engage with an outside team to do it. And there are pros and cons of that. Um, I, I think, you know, in Denver, ultimately, the conclusion was we struggled to hire mental and behavioral health mm -hmm. specialists, um, and we didn't have the expertise to train them. Uh, the, the idea of of, of creating that um, really responsive, adequately trained team in-house, just we didn't feel we had the capability. And we have some extraordinary uh, resources that exist in the city who were ready, willing, and able to step up. Um, but I think when you're looking at the team, it really, so much of it is, do they have the expertise what is their track re record on hiring and retention? Because it is these are these are tough jobs, and we oftentimes talk about how hard it is, you know, from a resiliency, self care standpoint, to be a nine one one operator. Um, these types of jobs are equally difficult and do um, involve some trauma by uh, those in, in you know that are doing the responding. And so you want to have an organization perhaps that has 
a track record um, of hiring those kinds of people, supporting them, understanding the, the special or unique dynamics of the job, the unique pressures of the job, um, people that can retain that workforce and have a, a, a demonstration of being able to retain the workforce. But you also want to have an organization that's got, you know, some um, stable funding streams, um, is one that you know can adequately support a program like this because they, they are um, expensive. Uh, you know, you've got uh, a training that needs to occur. You need to have the structures in place to recruit, the structures in place to support, um, uh, you know, a staff like this. Um, and on the back end, you know, they're, the, the, there's a big spotlight on these programs. Mm. And so there's a need also for a lot of data collection and reporting back. I mean, this is a group that you're going, as a city attorney, I look at this group and think, okay, is this group prepared to go and report regularly to city council? Because that's going to be expected of them. Are they going to be able to put together a report um, and a, a professional report? Um, and and are they at, are they putting the resources behind this program to make it successful? So you're not just looking at this from a legal point of view. Not just here's the ordinances and and laws that we need to amend or or adhere to. You're looking at a wider political lens here. Well, because I think in my role. And our role as city attorneys are to uh, outline the parameters of this relationship in the form of a contract. Mm. But if some of those contractual requirements like data sharing, data protection, data reporting, reporting back to council or the mayor's office regularly issuing of reports, if I don't think that they can comply with those provisions, I need to be I need to be alerting the decision makers and the policy makers and letting them know, hey, uh, we've got some concerns here because these are some basic expectations that the city is going to have in terms of performance by this group. Um, and I've got concerns about it. So um, outside of Denver, uh, Denver is sort of well known for having quite excellent uh, uh, social services, such as like the Coalition for the Homeless, gigantic and yeah. highly operative. Tell us a little bit about the agency that you chose to work with. Well, WellPower, um, and they have a new name. They were the Mental Health Centers of Denver, uh, is a longtime institutional institution in Denver. Um, they are the primary, they were a primary um, nonprofit community provider of mental and behavioral health services. Mm -hmm. They were you know, a key employer. Uh, they were a go-to and are a go-to um, uh, mental health provider in town. And so uh, well-known uh, folks that regularly, uh, the, the head of um, uh, WellPower, Dr. Clark would regularly come in and had regular meetings with the mayor's office uh, to provide um, feedback on what was happening in Denver. So th this was a, um, a known um, and very well-respected uh, community partner uh, and really the premier mental and behavioral health provider in, in the metro area. Well, that's so great to know. Uh, and maybe this is an awkward question, but if you had not had a strong partner to work with for to provide staff and supervision of staff, would it be more likely that your team would have said, well, let's think about embedding staff, uh, city staff into this program? I think we probably could have tried that, might have tried that. I mean, in some respects, that's really what co-responder was, mm -hmm. although they were, they rode along with the officers. I could have seen that ultimately evolve into more of a, a pure standalone alternative response model. Uh, but again, you know, we struggled to do that. I mean, cities just aren't well positioned um, to to provide be a direct service provider um, in many ways. And although alternative response, you know, in in our alternative response model, you know, there's a paramedic with the with the alter, with the STAR program uh, that responds on the scene. Um, and while we've done some, we have paramedics with our fire department, 
a lot of the paramedic work is also done through our public safety net hospital, which is not part of the city. It's a separate authority. Mm -hmm. So in our situation, um, it just would have been asking an awful lot of us uh, to create that in-house. Um, but I would say, you know, Jason, that notwithstanding the fact that we had a, a long, um, you know, a, a long existing partner that was prepared to step in that was very well funded and established, I don't think that it should be uh, it doesn't have it doesn't doesn't um, it doesn't mean that you can't a city can still work with more of a fledgling still developing um, alternative response program. I think it just means you've got to scale up slowly. And even with a very well established organization stepping in, there are going to be challenges. Um, and I think the wisest course is, to scale up slowly, to understand it's going to be hard to hire, it's going to take time. There, the technology issues, the technology barriers can't be understated. You know, it's it's they're reworking a a response routing system and dispatch, and all, you're going to make mistakes. And so, um, I think that it just means it may take a little longer uh, to get to a full fledged program. But it doesn't. I don't think it precludes it from happening. Well, could you speak a little bit about that? Um, your some, sometimes the secret silent partner in all of this is dispatch and emergency communications. How early did they get on board? I think they were involved from the day one. From day one, um, our nine one one system is run through technology services, um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, um, collaboration between technology services and public safety, and our we were struggling to keep 911 off operators. We were really struggling um, and and losing people uh, frequently. Um, and so I think this was also seen as, I mean, in many respects, we were, in some respects, we were really at our wits end in what we were gonna do. And change was in many respects driven by the need to find a new way and to alleviate some of the burden on dispatch. Uh, it it really can't be. I I agree. It can't be underscored enough how to get those folks need to be gotten in early, and often, and given the support to be real participants in the conversation. Yeah, and we piloted. You know, we piloted to diverting certain calls, seeing how it would work. Uh, but they've got they're the architects of that. They need to be the architects of that because they know the system best. Um, and, and they know what works. And getting the right scripts in place, getting the right training, you know, that just takes time. And so, um, yeah, I think you're right, earlier and often. The right software, yeah. Yes. Uh, and were you providing technical support for them as well in their, in their thinking about? We were at the table um, to, to talk it through, but not, no. I mean, I, th I think there was a... a a larger city team that was uh, primarily working on that, as I say, technology services really being at the lead, our 911 um, leadership, safety, um, and then the outside partners. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, when the team began to coalesce and uh, the first team leader emerged was Carly Salen, um, what sort of uh, technical support and, and just particular items were you working on with them? Well, so from the city uh, city attorney's perspective, you know, our job is to advise the agencies. And so- right. um, let's, let's just be clear that that's not the star team, that's city council? It's city, there's, there's city council, the mayor's office, and we're a strong mayor system. So a lot of this was being driven by um, the executive branch agencies, I including- see the police department, including technology services, including the mayor's office. Um, but city council was an important partner because under our form of government, ultimately they have to vote on approval of the star contract. So our job in some, in some instances is we're kind of in the middle of all of that in between the two branches of government, executive and legislative, because we're working with the mayors, uh, with the executive agencies to develop parameters for a contract that ultimately city council has to approve. 
So our our role early on was to um, make large and small risk tolerance decisions about the program um, and and presenting those to the decision makers and helping them work through assessing risk and how much risk are we going to try to transfer to uh, our alternative response partner? How much are we willing to retain understanding that the whole goal of this program is to reduce risk, risk ultimately by ensuring a proper response is sent uh, on site. Um, but we you know, kind of developed a checklist of legal issues that we needed to go through um, with our agency partners and uh, the alternative response team to ensure that um, we could, you know, that we could get to a contract that everyone was willing to sign and we could move forward with. Now you're experts in risk assessment or your police department. Was the union involved in any of these discussions? Union was involved and I, you know, I think in our early discussions with them, there was a reticence or a hesitancy um, maybe it was a skepticism uh, and part of it was because so much of the conversation um, came from an anger and community distress around very high profile incidents of excessive force by police officers and really violent interactions with community and so there there was a defensiveness there that we experienced and the more, and we also happened, a lot of this happened at some pivotal times in collective bargaining discussions, such that I think there was also a concern that by talking about alternative response, what we were really coding was um, a, a desire to slash police budgets, sla slash the full-time equivalents, FTEs, the positions of classified officers. And obviously all unions rely on membership dues. They rely on um, being the champions for the force um, and the classified um, the classified officers. And so the concept of, you know, the fear that the, the force was going to be civilianized was real, uh, but we were able to overcome that. You know, we sat down, we talked with them, they were brought in um, uh, certainly during collective bargaining discussions and otherwise, but you know, there was, I think, a lot of um, conversation that needed to happen, trust building uh, around, around what we were trying to do. And again, the shared values that we all had, which was let's not ask police to get into a situation where they're not either trained to handle it, prepared to handle it, um, and that this really in the end is good for everyone, including officers, uh, because they can focus on the things that they're they really um, should be working on, like, you know, more violent crime. And closing cases, yeah. And closing cases. And our case, uh, you know, under Chief Payson following STAR uh, and the success of STAR, you know, which took 1,400 uh, calls, right. uh, served 1,400 people in that first year, um, you know, we, we did see an increase case closure rates. Oh. And the chief was able on major crimes and the chief was able to reorganize uh, to really, I think, respond more effectively to uh, a, a surge we were seeing in violent crime, but also a concern of a growing concern around the failure to close cases quickly. And uh, we did see and Chief Pazin was successful in um, achieve, in seeing, you know, kind of a dramatic increase in the uh, closure rates. That's a fantastic data point. We're going to have to track that now that you've brought that to my attention, that if there's some correlation there, uh, that would be very valuable to us. I think so, too. And I think part of it is, you know, obviously the ability to effectively resource cases and, and to staff the violent crime issue and major crime issue in a way that, you know, he had more flexibility. Uh, but again, it, it also was a result of of reorganizations that he did to really um, target case closures, and so it, it was it was, but but um, taking you know say fourteen hundred calls off uh, off their hands was certainly a contributing factor. So I think it would be a good stat to to 
track. I mean, putting it in the context that they're, you know, you also needed to have a real plan and strategy around case case closures. Yeah, because uh, and and then also that that risk is real, and sometimes people who are uh, feeling like they're going to help be helpful can't really assess that correctly. And so the police experience is pretty important to listen to. And so what what time was this negotiating going on? Because there's so much changed uh, after George, George Floyd. Well, June 2020 is when the STAR program kicked off. So that's a pretty pivotal time, <laughs> as yeah. we all know. Yeah. So, the- so in a lot of our discussions were, you, you know, in the year prior, um, certainly, but um, but year prior and then the first year of implementation. That's a, that so many things happen. We're just going to 2020 is going to have an asterisk about next to it for about a hundred years. For, for sure. What the hell happened? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about your advice for teams and policy people who are thinking about putting together a team. What, what do they want? to be looking for and how can they make best use of their city attorney? Yeah, it's a, I've given it a lot of thought um, because I do think in some respects, we weren't quite as prepared as I would have liked us to have been as the city attorney's office uh, because it felt like this was such an innovative program. It was so new. We were, as I said, creating it out of whole cloth. Um, I think my advice to teams that are looking to stand up these programs, at least with respect to the city attorney, is to try to learn as much as you can early on about what some of those expectations of you will be. Because what you don't wanna have, you don't wanna be surprised. And you don't, I think there can be many times frustration or an impression that the city attorney's office isn't supportive of alternative first response. When in fact, they're very supportive, but they they have um, a job to do, and that is to protect the city uh, from a risk management standpoint and to uh, be those guardians. And, and there are a whole host of things, considerations that need to be taken into account. And sometimes what I've found is that community partners don't always know what those are and they hit them sort of by surprise. And so my recommendation is bringing the city or county attorney in early, not only because you want them to buy in to what you're trying to do and to ensure they see the big picture around how notwithstanding individual risk uh, mitigation decisions in a contract that overall alternative first response is a risk mitigation practice and one that has a great track record of success. Um, you know, we haven't had claims associated with 1,400 responses in that first year and not a single injury, not a single claim, not a single need to call police. That's, that, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's no amazing. No need to call police. That's So there's other cities that are tracking that data point and they are, they're not one, they're not zero. Definitely not well, and I'm not, I, look, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, knock on wood. We do that. We knock on wood. We know that at some point their star is going to have to call police, right? But in that first year, they didn't have to. And, and I just think um, that, that speaks volumes uh, to the success of these kinds of programs and the ultimate goal of mitigating risk. And so if you can bring that city attorney in early and, and have them, uh, you know, fully engaged in those conversations around harm reduction and risk mitigation, they see the big picture, then as they're making risk tolerance or giving risk tolerance advice and making certain decisions around things like indemnification requirements, which, you know, cities traditionally are very, very uh, strict. They are unbending. You know, you have to indemnify us no matter what. You know, there, there are decisions like that, that if you've got your city attorney bought in early on and understanding big picture that this is going to mitigate the city's risk, you may have better outcomes. But I would say, you know, goal one, figure out what are the main um, requirements that are going to need to be negotiated in that contract so that you, in formulating your own program, 
in setting up your own relationships around, say, insurance um, uh, or training or data protection, that you're prepared and you have a plan to address that issue um, as part of your program. So, so, uh, and so is as you're moving on in the path though, um, are there other items that you would on a checklist of things that you would uh, suggest uh, people looking at the, developing a program would would use their attorney for? Sure, sure. Um, and all and so these are some of the things certainly that that Denver looked at and mm -hmm. and every contract's different. every city has uh, you know different things that they look at. but I I can, Go through a few of ours and insurance is certainly one of them. And that's both insurance from a workers comp perspective to general liability type insurance. Another is, you know, the contract is undoubt, it, um, uh, most likely gonna lay out some training requirements because the city wants to ensure that you're training people appropriately. So you'll wanna understand what are those gonna be? Uh, what kinds of certifications or uh, requirements will there be for you to actually bring someone on and get them working in the field um, because you'll want to be prepared and from a timeline perspective um, understand what those are in advance. Um, I think the question of whether or not you're going to use city vehicles or not, you're going to use your own vehicles, you're going to use city vehicles, oh. right? Are those, you know, and and who, if so, there are going to be insurance issues perhaps related to that. Are you going to be plain closed? Are you going to be uniformed. If you're going to be uniformed, is the city going to pay for that? Um, does the city want maybe at least a name tag? I mean, just small things like that, but in terms of how your responders will appear, you know, in Denver, they're plain clothes. They're, they're in just regular street clothes, mm -hmm. but not every program may, may want to, not every city may want that. Mm -hmm. um, contract procurement, you know, some cities may need to go through a competitive bid process. Um, they can't sole source it under their charters. Even if it's, you know, kind of a uh, fait accompli, right? Like, you know, who's going to get this contract because yeah. it really is only one or two people even prepared to do it. Understanding the, pro the contract procurement process is important. It's also quite complicated at the municipal level. And a lot of times um, community organizations find it uh, challenging and frustrating. Uh, so, uh, learning about that early on can be really helpful. Uh, we mentioned earlier collective bargaining agreements. Uh, every collective bargaining agreement is unique. So uh, I can't speak to what would be in those, but there may be limitations in collective bargaining uh, that you need to know about uh, You know that could preclude, say, um, certain types of positions being held by civilians. And so you need to think about those collective bargaining agreements take a look at them, have them have someone take a look at them, um, or at least ask the city attorney's office if they're aware of any concerns uh, that, you know, have been identified in connection with collective bargaining. And, and you're not just talking about the persons directly working with Denver Star. You're talking about collective bargaining. So how many unions are affected here? We have three. Um, in Denver, we collectively bargain sheriff, police, and fire separately. Um, and so, you really want to ensure that those agreements don't have some limitation in them that would impact the scope of what your alternative response model can do. And again, they may not, but it's certainly on that checklist that the city attorney's office is going to be concerned about. Um, and to the extent there is uh, something in there that could create a limitation, you'll want to have, you know, be prepared to address it. Uh, but there's other issues. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier data sharing and uh, you know, the city may require a separate data sharing agreement to ensure that HIPAA-based or health-related protected information um, is controlled. Um, we talked about indemnification. The city attorney's office will also need to be outlining conditions under which the contract, you know, the, the, ven the, the alternative response provider could be fired, you know, and could be terminated. And what are those conditions going to be? Um, and in order to really draft those, they also need to understand how the alternative responders are doing what they do. And so again, that education, both of the city attorney, but also of the alternative response team uh, to understanding 
the, the you know the legal the legal issues, but the city attorneys need to understand how the program's going to work. What the so all of this is just going to take. Mm -hmm. Yes, and all and all of this is going to take time. Uh, so, so those are some of the things I think I would you know say are worthy of initial conversations with the city attorney so you can get some understanding of what the expectations of you are going to be. Let me ask about two other partners we haven't mentioned yet. The county, and I'm not sure what the city-county relationship is in Denver. We're one and the same in Denver. Uh, we are a city-county. City that makes county. it so much easier. Yeah, yeah. it does. And I, I think the real, for, for those of us, for those municipalities, um, you know, where you have a city and a county, the county function, you know, will most likely be your public health response. Um, they may have mental and behavioral health expertise already, but they're also un, un, uh, more than likely managing your jail population and may be a real right. ally to you in that regard. So, um, yeah, bringing both a city attorney and the county attorney in early on is a good idea. And what about the state? Uh, this, through the state fl flows Medicaid. Were you involved in any of those conversations about how to get funding through the state? Federal you know, we, we were not. Um, it's very possible that our public health department assisted in those uh -huh. conversations, but I think that was um, primarily done by the STAR team. So as we're just wrapping up, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you think the future of all this is? Uh, we're just getting started, it seems, in a new profession, a new, a new public service. Where do you think we're going? I mean, I think the sky's the limit in a lot of ways. Um, I do think there's great momentum around these programs and the track records speak for themselves. I think they've had, um, you know, we have a workflow, we have a workforce issue that's mm -hmm. really challenging. We don't have enough mental and behavioral health trained professionals in this country. And particularly in a lot of dense urban areas where affordable housing is a problem, um, I say the sky's the limit, but you know, you're know you gonna be limited by the resources you have available to you. And so I think a focus on how we can grow that pipeline, that workforce is gonna be really important. Um, are we training the trainers? Do we have enough professionals out there that understand trauma-informed care, that understand harm reduction, that, um, you know, are available to help us train the folks in the field, and then can we hire and retain those folks? And a lot of these are capacity issues, um, but I think from a public safety standpoint, the case is being made. That, um, and that case is a strong one thus far. I don't think, uh, you know, I think that the continued um, trend you're seeing right now in jury verdicts, uh, people are fed up. Um, juries are um, very, very tough on officers right now, and they really do not, uh, they don't have much uh, patience for, um, you know, an overly, um, an overly aggressive response to people in crisis. I think the stigma around mental and behavioral health is fortunately um, uh, very effectively um, you know, being attacked and the stigma is starting to ease. People are willing to talk about it. It's becoming more accepted and understood that this is a problem we as human beings just simply have. And every one of us is probably gonna have some mental or behavioral health concern at some point in our lives. And because of that and that loss of the stigma, I think that the concepts around the acceptance of and the desire for mental and behavioral uh, health and alternative response, um, you know, is only going to grow. And then the last thing I'll say is with that, hopefully comes funding. Because these programs, it is vitally important that these programs um, have uh, diverse funding streams. Uh, municipal budgets are so dependent on the economy. Many yeah. of them are strictly tied to sales tax, lodging tax. And when something like a COVID happens and a pandemic, those budgets get slashed. And right. so it's so important that these alternative response models 
are funded through corporate donors, uh, private donors, public dollars at every level of government. As I said, in Denver, we have a dedicated funding stream through a sales tax, dedicated sales tax revenue, but that is also impacted by the economy. So you have to have a diverse funding stream. And I think we are seeing a greater and greater understanding of the importance of um, dedicating budget, budget space for these kinds of programs. Well, Kristen Bronson, this is a very provocative conversation. You've given me a lot to think about and our AMSA members a lot to dwell on. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us and thank you for helping Denver Star. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate the conversation.